Good afternoon everyone, we will be sharing the Routine Activities Theory with you today. The RED is a theory of crime which focuses on temporal and spatial factors of crime events. It considers crime from an individual and a society-wide approach. It's one of the opportunity theories of crime which suggests that offenders rationally choose targets with high reward and little effort and risk. It is also a part of the effort of studying the spatial patterning of crime at different levels of aggregation. Based on the red, crime results from the convergence of three elements in time and space, which leads to the different likelihood of crime occurring. A likely offender is one who has the propensity and ability to commit a crime. Their approach assumes a ready supply of likely offenders and does not focus on individual differences in the inclination to commit crime. A suitable target can be a person or an object. Value may refer to monetary value or young and attractive targets. Inertia refers to how easily the item can be removed from the area. A likely offender has to see the object before assessing if it's suitable. And lastly, the more easily the offender can get to an item, the more suitable it is. A capable guardian protects the target. We are guardians over our own property. The revised model has included elements which control offenders and protect place. Parents or parole officers exert an influence over a likely offender, while security guards and receptionists have a responsibility over a particular place. The very straightforward nature of this theory states that crime results from the convergence of these three elements, the presence of an offender and target and the absence of capable guardians. This is the crime triangle. The inner triangle represents necessary elements for crime, while the outer triangle represents the potential controllers. The presence of one effective controller or the removal of any one of the inner elements can prevent the criminal event. Routine activities refer to day-to-day -day happenings, including factors unique to lifestyles and means people use to satisfy their needs. Next, we shall see how this theory is used to explain criminal events. Let's explain it further with an example. No! My money! Right. So, so Kefu was doing her work at Starbucks. Ooh, and who do we have here? A potential offender. Just look at her creepy and intense eyes. So the second factor we have is target suitability. And here we have cameras, phones, wallets, laptops, money, which are all prime targets for theft. So of course, the lack of guardians would then make the crime possible. When So Kefu leaves to go to the bathroom, the offender makes her move. All together now, no! However, if So Kefu brings her laptop to the bathroom, there is capable guardianship, thus the crime does not occur. Let's have a few more examples that are not so straightforward. Out of the four qualities describing suitable targets, inertia refers to size and weight of the object or person, its degree of portability and how easily it can be removed from the area. Obvious examples are Starbucks merchandise and makeup. They are small, lightweight and can fit easily into the hand or bag. Therefore, they make easy targets. Question: Is it easier to steal a 300 kilo panda or a 3000 kilo car? All things being equal, it may seem counterintuitive to steal the heavier car. But why? Heavier and bigger objects are less desirable, but cars come with wheels that make the criminal behavior less effortful. On the other hand, it's very difficult to move a car that has got its wheels clamped. It has lots of inertia then perhaps you're just better off stealing a panda. Last example, clothes stores have their valuable items displayed prominently. However, a simple lightweight security tag increases the inertia of the items. Therefore, inertia is not simply about size or weight. Empirical evidence In the past, the theory was typically applied to exploitative, predatory and contact crime. Since then, from the list of supporting evidence, we can see that it readily explains and supports a broad range of criminal activity. In turn, the strength of the theory lies not only in its explanatory power, but also in its ability to inform crime prevention measures in a straightforward manner. In the past few years, the theory has also been extended to new types of deviant behaviour, for example, cyber-stalking and cyber-bullying. These crimes didn't even exist when the theory was first developed. Although formulated in the late 70s, routine activities theory remains sensitive to broad social and technological changes. This is important because cyberspace has unique characteristics such as infinite anonymity and time-space compression, which makes online crime distinctly different from its real-life counterpart. Now, let us discuss some of the criticisms the theory has. One of the most common criticisms is the use of indirect measures. 
This reliance on indirect measures may cause conclusions drawn to be removed from the actual events involved in victimization risk. In the case of rape, simply stating past reoffending behavior, time away from home, or even walking home alone may not suffice. Hence, in order to overcome these weaknesses, it may be more worthwhile to look directly and closely at specific measures of lifestyle and social activities. So instead of simply stating time away from home, one can specify exactly where or what does one do when away from home. Incorporation of such direct and specific measures help better identify when, where and why may one be more susceptible to victimization. Another criticism that RIT has is its tendency to blame victims. This is especially so in the case of rape. In the case of rape, suitable targets are often individuals who are valuable, accessible and are able to be moved. Therefore, this implies that in order to avoid rape, the victim has to change her lifestyle. It is essential that we separate causation from blame or moral accountability. Although the victim's presence and routine activities causally contribute to the crime, it is the offender who is assigned legal and moral responsibility. Understanding causal links helps in crime prevention efforts. There are several practical implications in the area of crime preventing efforts, policy making and police investigations due to straightforward principles in red theory. One such policy is the place-oriented initiatives, which include modification of environment and situational variables to help minimize individuals' exposure to potential offenders and make offenses more easily observable. This includes increasing guardianship and security measures. Community policing where neighborhood watch groups are created and citizens are thought to look out for suspicious behavior are involved. Social policies such as intervention programs for potential offenders or mentoring programs such as Youth at Risk by National Youth Council as well as educating potential targets on personal safety and smart decision making in routine activities help to decrease risk. Lastly, legal implementations include offense penalties as well as imprisonment. Putting these implications together, using an example of a girl jogging at night, we might want to reduce her target suitability by encouraging her not to carry obvious valuables around, install lampposts to increase crime visibility, and advise her to jog in the day instead of at night. Strategies can be done to enhance the number of capable guardians, be it the common citizens, handlers, or place managers. The theory also helps in police geographic profiling, focus investigative activities and geographically prioritise patrolling efforts. RET is a firm theoretical foundation for crime prevention methods and helps us to understand crime patterns to make informed decisions for crime prevention and intervention. However, there are downsides to the theory and there certainly are trade-offs in these theoretical implications and must hence be used with caution.